I'm Besa Luce, and welcome to the second season of Other Talking Points, a K2.0 podcast. At Other Talking Points, we delve into a wide body of work that is produced across the region. Work that is sometimes overlooked, work that is less covered in the media, or work that opens up new perspectives. So over the next couple of months, I will be talking to authors, scholars, artists, and activists from Kosovo, the region, and beyond to explore their work, ideas, and lives in order to bring to you new insights on our world. We will be covering policy, historical and cultural studies, and works that provide insight into current affairs. In this first episode, we will be talking about political discourses and narratives about the region, how they're constructed, how they relate to political reality, who gets to shape them, and finally, how these narratives shape the region. Since the end of the Yugoslav Wars, the dominant framework applied to the region has been that of international development. There's been a focus on reconciliation, transition to democracy, and so forth. But such frameworks are being increasingly criticized, particularly as there seems to be a fundamental conflict between local agency and the international community's efforts to control these processes. One example of this is the EU's political strategy toward the Western Balkans, which is often described as arbitrary or even hypocritical in nature. The question of whether Brussels is genuinely committed to the region's EU accession is more pertinent than ever. Critics argue that the EU accession process is now just half-hearted lip service meant to simply contain and placate the people of the Western Balkans. One place where we see the consequences of this is in the EU's approach toward Kosovo. In particular, the EU's mediating role in the Kosovo and Serbia dialogue. From the semi-colonialism of the West's post-war reconstruction in Kosovo, to the constant scolding by Miroslav Lajčak, the EU's special representative for the dialogue, and by Joseph Borrell, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, that Kosovo's European future is at stake unless it's compliant, it's clear that we are meant to feel like subservient second-class Europeans. Enlargement fatigue is without doubt taking place, particularly given the divided attention of EU officials, who are dealing with the rise of semi-authoritarian regimes inside the bloc, the ongoing economic and energy crisis, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and now Israel's war on Gaza. The international media and academia also play a role in shaping how we understand and engage in such discussions. All too often, their narratives tend to disregard local experiences and local voices. Just recently, at K2.0, we published a text by Aida Hozic, a scholar originally from Sarajevo, who writes and teaches about international politics at the University of Florida. The text is a previously unpublished review she wrote two decades ago on the manuscript for the 2006 book called Peace at Any Price, How the World Failed Kosovo. In her review, she called the book a blatant call for a return to colonialism. It's incredible to see how 20 years later, so little has changed in the international political discourse toward Kosovo. Aida will be one of my guests in this episode. My other guest is Aidan Heher. He is a reader in international relations at the University of Westminster. His research interests include transitional justice, humanitarian intervention, and state building in the Balkans. Aidan has also contributed to K2.0 and other regional media with his critical views of the international community's approach toward the region. I'm very much looking forward to discussing their views on these subjects. Aida, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Bessa. I, I have been admiring K2.0 for a very, very long time, so it's really a, an incredible privilege to be on the podcast and to be published um, online. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Aidan, it's so great to have you here as well. Thank you, Bessa. Yeah, you do great work here and really honored to be part of the podcast. So thank you. Yeah, well, thanks Thanks to both of you. And yeah, and we also appreciate a lot, a lot your work and very happy that uh, we've had the opportunity to publish a lot of text with you, Aidan, both online and in our print magazine. And recently, Aida, our first collaboration uh, together with this review that you wrote 20 years ago. And yeah, maybe I would like to begin from, uh, from there and 
um, it's something that, as you mentioned in the text, that you just stumbled across and had kind of forgotten that you'd written about it. And um, there's this one expression that you use in the introduction where you're setting up uh, the review for the uh, for the readers. You, you use this expression, colonial gaze, uh, to describe the international community's approach toward Kosovo. But I think it's safe to assume that we can use that in general for the international community's approach towards the rest of the region as, uh, uh, as well. And you say that this description today is a marker of the times that we live in. So can you maybe just talk a bit more about that, how the colonial gaze and practice manifests today? I have been obsessing over this relationship between the quote-unquote international community, which I think is kind of a really a group, a relatively small group of states, um, in their relation to conflict spaces for a very long time. Um, and some, some also some 20 years ago, um, I actually wrote how places like uh, Kosovo, uh, Bosnia, at that time Rwanda, um, that they are really invented as kind of unwanted colonies. It's a very different relationship than colonialists had before to places which they found worthy or of value and they they wanted their resources, they would occupy them, they would control the populations. Um, the relationship towards uh, these conflict zones is really the one of, as you said, they, they try to kind of pacify them, they try to stabilize them, they want them um, out of their way in terms of interferences in their domestic politics. Um, they want them off the television screens or now off our kind of computer screens. Um, but they, but they, so they so they need to invest in them. The interventions are done, uh, you know, because they because they need to yes make them pacify them, but they really don't want them. Um, and so it's a very uh, different kind of relationship uh, than imperialism of the nineteenth century. But the gaze is the same. The way that these places are uh, portrayed, interpreted, um, understood. Um, is still the one which is very much shaped by the ideas of kind of the standards of civilization, of the of the rankings uh, of civilizations, of um, you know the, the 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 ideas that that somehow these backward places need to advance in order to be admitted in a in an exclusive club, um, and it permeates the work of international organizations um, in post conflict areas. And I'll just uh, just want to add something very quickly to that. Um, I recently came across this uh, expression um, about this, like a state of becoming. Uh, and I was thinking about it that we're constantly made to think and believe that we are becoming into something. And I think it's also very much uh, a result of how international development has been set up and, and also intervention in general has been set out and also how it's manifested itself uh, across our region, but not only because, of course, it takes place in other parts of the world as well. So the state of becoming where you're constantly waiting to get somewhere, but you never really get that. How do you see get there? So how do you see that relationship uh, playing out today? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that temporality is really important. Uh, that, that's a, It's a wonderful way of putting it, but it's all, it's, you know, but the irony of it, I think, is also that that we were something before. Uh, so you are in a constant state of becoming. And I think in the context of Europe, it's like you're constantly trying to be European when, when actually you've been European all your life. Uh, you know, and someone someone has just decided at some point to change these definitions. Um, so so you know, from the from the Balkans perspective, we are constantly trying to become something that that we already once were. Um and uh, and that makes it even more difficult um, and and problematic because the exclusion um, is really then the 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 underlying um, theme in that relationship. You really have to be first excluded from the community to which you belonged before, in order to be in that state of constant becoming. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Aida. And Aiden, I'd like to connect here uh, with you and actually maybe not talk about the EU uh, uh, a, a bit as well, because um, I think especially as of lately, we've also heard this statement that uh, coming from uh, high representatives at the EU political level, that uh, especially towards Kosovo, that if 
the agreement on the association for a certain majority municipalities is not signed that Kosovo can also forget about its EU integration uh, uh, future. And it links with what Aida was talking about, like who gets to decide who is included and who is uh, excluded uh, also. And and just to talk a bit about the EU's presence through the dialogue in, in Kosovo uh, and in Serbia, it's been a process that's been going on for more than a decade now. And in Kosovo, for sure, it's shaped a lot of how we think and talk of politics, whether we're like internally, domestically, but also how we understand ourselves in internationally, in the international stage, if I if I may say so. And and it's also kept us back a lot, I think, from focusing on other areas of state building. I think as uh, uh, as a country, and you've been very critical of the EU's uh, approach towards the EU in the, the dialogue, the, the role that it's played. And you've even called it a farce in one of your recent articles at, at K2.0. So can you just share your insights and your critiques specifically in this role of mediation? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think when, when we last met, Pesa, I, I, I mentioned that, you know, I, I loved Aida's um, review. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there was one particular line in it that I think sums a lot, a lot of the sums up the way the, the EU thinks about the region more generally and w where she said that um, the manuscript offers a politically dangerous description of an allegedly cursed land populated with ignorant and zealous people who are beyond salvation save for some authoritarian exercise of power by their civilizing outsiders. It's, it's um, I, I really wish I'd written that myself. It's, it perfectly encapsulates the way they think about it and, and specific, and it's not just a, you know, an academic um, curiosity. It has real implications for Kosovo today and I'm, I'm sure for Bosnia too. But, um, you know, Joseph Borrell that you mentioned previously, he, he gave a speech recently where he described Europe as a garden and he said, um, uh, every, everything works, he said, and outside the garden, it's a jungle. And he said, we can build a wall, but, you know, the wall will never be high enough because the jungle will keep growing. Uh, so we have to go into the jungle basically. Now, you know, that, that kind of language, that sort of framework of thinking about the world. And I mean, when he said Europe, you know, he, he didn't mean the Balkans, because as Aida said, it's, it's not considered part of Europe, even though clearly it is. Um, and that mindset, you know, it, it's not just something that influences literature or films, you know, and obviously that book, um, Inventing Ruritania, talks about that in great detail. But it, it has an implication today for how you know, the, the, the welfare, the livelihoods of the people living in this region is, is affected by that mindset. And, and the key way in which that is, um, I think, enacted is, is the European Union, when it, when it goes to, you know, these negotiations, it, it treats the, the parties on the ground, you know, like they are infants, like they are children that need to be led towards some predetermined outcome that the adults understand what's good for them. And these people are, you know, at best teenagers who, who don't really know what they need. And we have to guide them towards this predetermined end point. And the agency of local people here is completely denied then. And, you know, on, on top of that, there is this assumption as well that, you know, Aida mentioned too, that prior to the, the Europeans coming here, it was a wasteland, you know, th there was nothing, you know, that, that, that we have to teach these people from scratch. And, you know, for many years, I, I worked at the American University in Kosovo on, on their summer school. And there was a lot of guys who, who taught on that summer school who, who were Americans who'd been here in, in 1999 uh, as part of UNMIC or K4 or whatever. And, you know, after a few glasses of wine, a few beers, whatever, they would start talking about what it was like when they got here. And the, the way they described it, I remember one guy in particular saying it was the Stone Age. You know, we landed in the Stone Age. There was nothing. You know, there was no civil society. There was no understanding of politics. There was no understanding of mobilization. There was just an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, this kind of discourse. And you think, you know, the, these people set up a parallel political system throughout the 1990s where they educated themselves, where they had their own health system, where they mobilized, you know, resistance to a violent authoritarian regime, you know, where there was uh, local civil society movements that dealt with the, um, the blood feuds issue in the early 1990s without any external support. And to come here and assume we're starting from scratch, it's year zero, these people need to learn how to wash their hands. It, it, it just creates that, you know, that sense that there is nothing but us and, and we have to guide them. And, and it's still here today. You know, 2023, the, you know, the international community have been here since 1999. And that's the, that's the thing that Kosovo has that other parts of the Balkans, former Yugoslavia in particular, don't have, is that, that degree of invasive international engagement on the ground. And if, and if today they are still describing 
Kosovo as this kind of savage land populated by nationalists who just don't know what they're doing, then you kind of have to say to them, well, what have you been doing for the last 24, 25 years? You know, you've been, you've been in control. There was the OSCE, there was NATO, there was the UN, there was the European Union. You've all been on the ground ostensibly um, educating these people. You know, so, so what, we, surely at some point you have to accept some of the blame. And that certainly comes across in Aida's review of, of, of the, that particular book, that there was this incredulity on the part of the international community that we, we tried to, to educate the savage and look what they've done. You know, we, we, we've poured all this money in, we've given them all our best lines and they still, you know, resort back to violent ethnic cleansing and it's nothing to do with us. It's all their fault because they are, you know, essentially um, primeval. And uh, as I say, it's, 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 it's pervasive. And at the moment, with, with respect to the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, it is having a, a massive uh, impact. And um, it, it's something that's very, very dangerous in the long term. Could you maybe just yeah, talk a bit about how you see the dialogue having evolved or has it actually evolved since it started in 2011? Because I think... In kind of your critiques, you you always you also say that there's been a bit of a shift since, specifically since Albin Kurti came to power, so since Vendosia came to power, where uh, in the way that he has approached the, the dialogue, that the, and to a certain extent, because he's 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 being called stubborn by by the EU. Some people in Kosovo will say that actually no, he's just more assertive in kind of what he wants to get out of uh, out of the talks out of the out of the dialogue but it does feel that the kind of the lack of patience in a way from the international community towards Kosovo has, has increased and i mean obviously we've also seen sanctions being placed on uh, Kosovo also the us has been very uh, kind of like taking this scolding approach uh, towards the Kosovo government so what are the dynamics that are playing out there Yeah, I mean, I think for for a long time, the internationals here in Kosovo, the way they treated the, the, the local government was that, that they expected compliance, they expected subservience. Um, and, you know, that, that was how the dynamic um, evolved for many, many years. And the, the government here largely uh, went along with that and, and pretty much nodded their head whenever the international community asked them to do something, particularly the United States. Um, and the dialogue began in 2011 in that particular framework. Now, You know, I'm from Ireland and, and one of the worst things you could ever say in Ireland when I was growing up was something um, critical of America because we were so, you know, committed to everything America ever did. We needed the American tourists to come here, blah, blah, blah. So I appreciate that people in Kosovo, for very good reasons, love America and, you know, welcomed the internationals in, in, in 1999, specifically in terms of military intervention. But what the internationals have been increasingly pushing Kosovo towards is something that's not good for Kosovo. And I think that's the, the, the key point here is that when the West's power started to go into decline in 2008, they started to really reassess their overseas commitments and started to think again about some of the alliances that they had. And in the, the specific case of Kosovo, a decision was evidently made at some point that we now need to focus on being nice to Serbia, essentially. Let's try to ensure that we bring Serbia into the Western fold. And if that means pushing Kosovo into the wilderness, then that's a price we're willing to pay. And unfortunately, too many governments here, successive governments, went along with that and signed things that they didn't actually want to um, implement themselves. The obvious example is the special court that the, the government technically agreed to, but you know they all said we only did it because the Americans told us we had to. And then an interesting thing happened in Kosovo, whereby a new government came in that simply said, well, we're not going to do that anymore. And of course, then there was outrage, you know, because the Americans and the, the Europeans, they love Kosovo so long as Kosovo does everything they ask them to do. And, and if you look at what Kurti is asking for, um, it doesn't strike me as being anything other than perfectly reasonable. You know, we have to talk about status. We have to talk about this question of recognition. We can't just proceed on the basis that we're going to do whatever you want us to do so that it benefits Serbia's accession towards the European Union. And we're kept in this, this wasteland without visas, without any European prospects, without any recognition. And he's asking difficult questions. And of course, the, the EU um, mediators and the, the US embassy, you know, have, have, have um, blown their top because that this is not what they want. This is not what they expect from, from locals. You, you know, you're ungrateful, you're stubborn, you're a nationalist, you're a Marxist. Everything is thrown at the current government despite the fact that they, they won the largest majority um, of any political party in Kosovo's history. So obviously they, they are speaking on behalf of the people at the moment. And, and, and I think we reached a point around 2017 
when people just said, we've had enough. You know, they won the last three elections. They've become the, the largest single party in the last three elections for good reason. You know, mass exodus of people from Kosovo, huge amounts of corruption, uh, complete stagnation internationally. No wonder the people here decided we want to go on a different path. Um, and the fact that he is standing up for, for Western values at a time when the West is abandoning those values, it, it's not his fault. You know, it's the international context that he finds himself in at the moment that, that is one that's not receptive to these ideas of, of democracy and justice. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Aidan. Um, you, you mentioned something earlier also about kind of the, like we hear this, all the money that's been poured in from uh, the international community in Kosovo and in the region. And um, Aida, to connect here with you, I mean, obviously both in Kosovo and in Bosnia, but I mean, across the region, there is for sure this... Uh, this financial contribution, the EU is the biggest donor and it also has done a lot of work also in terms of reconstruction following following the war, uh, the wars, but not just that. It's, uh, it supports uh, institutions across, basically, and also civil society. There's a lot of uh, uh, support money in, in that regard. So, of course, I would say that in our societies, especially in Kosovo, Kosovo is still very extremely EU enthusiast. I think that's changing. It's fading slowly, but still there's a lot of, of course, support for, for the EU integration process. But I think on one hand, how, how do we how, how do we approach the criticism also? So because on one hand, yes, there is a lot of support as well that we cannot deny that has has been there throughout uh, throughout the years but yes we also have to be uh, uh, to be critical so how how do we maintain this critical approach i would say in such contexts or how have you seen it play out maybe in other countries in the region uh, in the region as well i mean let me put it this way first of all the, the a lot i'm i'm not an eu specialist and i think with the eu uh, one really has to know and understand how the mechanisms work because they are the incentives and the funds are very different. They are distributed in different ways. They are targeted. Um, and so they flow differently to candidate countries, to countries which are on the waiting list to become candidate countries in accession period. I mean, you know, and so so I think that that kind of a fine grained analysis of how these funds work uh, is always very, very much needed. Um, I think in terms of enthusiasm for EU, um, you know, I, I think it's still present in the region because there's there's very there's really no alternative. Uh, and I think what I'm what I'm sad about is that the EU does not understand that it doesn't have an alternative. That 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 it really kind of its integration of Western Balkans. But I would probably go even further that it should have integrated Turkey at the time, and Turkey was very eager to become a part of EU. Uh, that would have made uh, and Ukraine, that that would have these kind of enlargements of the EU uh, would have made um, Europe stronger um, and we perhaps would not be in the predicament in which we, we are um, at the moment. The, uh, um, the, the, but it, it does come back to this kind of how does, it, it, a lot of this is about what way and how does Europe envision itself how does the how does europe kind of identify itself and what does it think that where its boundaries are um and who belongs and who does not belong um and i i'm terrified about the fact that 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 europe has uh you know even through the enlargement process uh really insisted on the vision of itself as a white christian europe um and uh and and I it pains me to say this, but I do think that a lot of uh, it's reflected in the kind of rejection of refugees. It's reject it's reflected in the rejection of the migrants, um, and it's reflected of the rejection in the rejection of particular parts of Europe more so than some other parts of Europe. Um, and I think sadly that that sentiment of how we have to defend this really white core from the jungle that's outside. Um, has only grown stronger um, in the in the last decade. Um, so where do we stand in that dynamic and kind of who is at fault that all of these funds have been spent and you know they have been misused? Um, there's there's definitely, and I think we all know that well, every, every, one, every one of us who, who who looks at Balkans, I was just looking at the map yesterday in Bosnia, you know, only like 150 out of 370 kilometers of of uh, the major highway through Bosnia have been built in the last 20 years. 
Um, and it's because of corruption. It's because of the fights over where the road is going to go and who's going to make the money off it and, you know, which company is going to get what mile of the road. Uh, so we know that that's obviously stalling it. But that is systemic, in my view. These these problems of the kind of uh, use and misuse of funds um, are systemically induced precisely because we sit in that state of becoming constantly in this limbo land of uh, never to achieve the status that, once again, we once upon a time had. Um, and in the meantime, these lands have become dispopulated. Um, and while there is a lot of scratching of the hands and a lot of self-blame and uh, you know kind of self-destruction, if you wish, even in the in the region over uh, why we haven't done better in this period, I don't see the same kind of reflection on the part of the EU or even the United States in terms of where did we go wrong? Okay. On the contrary, you look at the I've been obsessing over Ukraine and and kind of Ukrainian recovery. For a long time now, um, you know, not, not ever since the 2014 rather than 2022 of like, what is this country going to look like in the future? Because it's huge. You know, it's kind of the Balkans amplified. And uh, and then you look at like the Lugano conference on recovery and you see that, you know, they basically kind of list all of these failed places, you know, uh, Kosovo, Bosnia, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and kind, and kind of examples of recovery. And I look at Ukraine and I'm thinking, gosh, I mean, if this becomes that nightmare, uh, you know, again, where is Europe going to go? Uh, but the but the but the narratives which are created over the last three decades of the kind of liberal interventionism and its success do not allow for question marks. And to connect maybe with uh, what Aida was talking about, that when she said that one of the reasons maybe that there is also a like enthusiasm towards the EU and joining the EU in the region persists is because also there's, there hasn't been another political alternative. And I remember, Aidan, in um, the cover story that you did for, for Kosovo 2.0 in the Hope magazine issue, you also talk a bit about this. That you, say that you say that the EU also presented itself as the only option after the war, so in the, in the, in the early 2000s. So even the space for a different kind of political imagining was not there actually after the uh, after the 2000s and i've always wanted to ask you actually what could have been potential potentially other alternatives at the time because also you know after after i mean the early 2000s there was so much work that needed to be done i think in all of our, of our societies not just in terms of with one another but also internally there was a lot of destruction a lot of lives lost uh, there was a lot of rebuilding of uh, institutions and things were not necessarily starting from zero scratch because yes there was a there is a history and there's a lot of also good not just bad history uh, uh, behind us but what what could have been or how how could it have looked differently maybe at that time even potentially the relationship with the uh, with the EU because it there was 2003 Thessaloniki the summit this big promise and now we're 2023 and None of the countries in the region have joined necessarily. I mean, have not. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I don't think it would have made much sense for, you know, somebody like me, an outsider, to come here in 1999 or 2000 and say you shouldn't try to join the European Union. You give up on that and you know um, try and plow your own furrow or <clears throat> go in a completely different direction. I, I, I think the the notion that joining the European Union or joining NATO was a good thing, wasn't a, a, um, a crazy idea. It's, it's the, the manner in which it has proceeded, I think, has been one in which at, at a certain point, I felt that it was obvious that this wasn't something that was on the agenda any longer in Brussels or in Washington. And yet people here still felt that it, it was something that was, you know, just next year, if we do this, if we do that, you know, like the whole thing with visa liberalization, where you kind of have the annual we're getting visa liberalization next year celebrations, you know, these kinds of things. It just kept people on this 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 hook that there was no sense of, of you know, reflection, you know, generally. And, and, and th there were then a lot of academics and journalists and think tanks and people like that that did start to go, wait a minute, I just don't think this is plausible anymore. <clears throat> but the, 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 the point of it being, the, uh, the, sorry, the framing of it being like the, 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 the report that came out in 2005 that said that the... Um, 
the, the alternative was to become the black hole of Europe. You know, that was the language that they used, that there was no alternative. I, I, I'm not sure that I ever really agreed with that. But I think at some point somebody could have said, look, we, we're really not going to join the European Union anytime soon. And we can't just be in this state of, of constant, you know, um, anticipation of something that's going to come around the corner. I mean, somebody put something on, on Twitter uh, maybe a month ago saying if at the pace that Montenegro is going, it joined, a, it was a candidate state, state in, in 2012. At the pace it's currently at, it, it'll join the European Union in 112 years, you know, in terms of the number of chapters that have been closed. And you think, okay, well, that, you know, if, if that's true, which it is statistically, you know, where is Kosovo? Kosovo isn't even a candidate state, you know. And if you ask me, what's the alternative to, to joining the European Union and stuff like that for Kosovo? Well, you know, I... I the, the world that we're living in is one where the, the West is not getting bigger. You know, the West is shrinking and, and what the West is, is is very, very different today than what it liked to think it was in the 1990s. This idea of the end of history and, you know, uh, progress and liberal democracy for all sweeping the world, that, that's not happening. We have enlargement fatigue. We have this, like I say, re rethinking of the principles that we claimed were European values at one point. And, and, and Kosovo, I think, and the people in the, the region more generally need to look at the, the European Union and look at the way the West is going and look at the fact that the United States, the people in the United States elected Trump and think, is, is that the way we want to go? Now, I'd love to be able to say to you, well, here's the alternative. You know, I, I, I don't necessarily see a ready-made alternative, but there must be indigenous forces in the Balkans who can link together to try to think of an alternative to this. There is no path except the European Union. You know, and, and the other thing, just to kind of highlight with that as well, is that so long as people here are being told they can't join and, will, and you know, they need to keep jumping through hoops, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, no matter how many times you fulfill these criteria, you're never quite European. People will find alternatives in areas that really are, are, are um, very dangerous. Um, it could be Islamic fundamentalism. It could be greater ties with Turkey, greater ties with countries in, in the um, the Arab world. It could be, you know, rampant sectarian nationalism, those kinds of things. They are attractive alternatives to a, an unemployed 20-year-old, you know, who's living in, 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 in one of the countries of the Balkans. And, and, and that then can become for people the alternative. And if the EU thinks it can keep this place in this kind of suspended animation for the next decade, I think it's very naive. You know, hopes have been raised and they've been dashed massively. And if, you know, history is any guide, then when people's hopes have been dashed, they become very, very angry. You know, and unless there is some, you know, uh, a means by which this path can be made clearer and made less rocky, um, I, I fear for the future of the region, really. And Aida, how, how do you see that? How would you... Uh like see, like in a, in a larger context, I think also, especially for example, what's happening in let's say in in Bosnia in particular, because I think Kosovo and Bosnia are kind of, I mean, they are two two states, two countries coming out of Yugoslavia that still continue to have uh, uh, problems, to say like in the in the lightest way, in terms of like how how the state functions, and uh, so and we were talking earlier about you know, what were ideals of the EU and how the EU was understood, especially in, in the early 2000s. And, it, it you know, we, we really held the EU very, very high. And I think, it, I mean, Kosovo, I think it started, started even earlier from, from, from the 90s as, as the wars were happening, the violent wars were happening elsewhere, like this idealization of the EU was very much present, I, uh, I would have to say. So how do you see people responding in the region, in terms of the conversations being uh, being had, whether in academia or uh, in the media or just in civil society, in terms of what does this erosion of European values actually also mean for uh, for us, or are these conversations taking place? I mean, I think Bos there there are similarities and huge differences between Bosnia and Kosovo. Obviously, I think the the, the main similarity is that we are both. Whether we like it or not, we are protectorates. We are really, you know, the kind of the, the there is a there is a lack of independence here, the lack of the full agency to the government that that we are still uh, living with in one way or the other. Um, I think my great admiration, as Aidan had has has wonderfully explained, for the current government in Kosovo is precisely because it has managed to break through that, to actually kind of show. Uh, that there is a, a desire and a, and a, and a, and a, and following of a path which is not entirely dictated by the desires of um, the EU or or the United States, um, so that there is a much greater kind of assertion of independence. 
uh, that Bosnia is more divided. Uh, it's institutionally divided, so that kind of internal functioning is obviously hindered um, by the divisions imposed by the Dayton Peace Agreement. Um, and uh, and so getting to the point of kind of that unity and independence and assertion is is much more is much more difficult. Um, and uh, you know, so you do get exactly what as Aidan is saying, you get all of these kind of nefarious links and you get every in Bosnia, you get every every kind of quote unquote ethnic group, uh, even though I don't like to think about Bosnia in those terms, but they have been institutionalized um, and empowered through the priest process. Um, they're all looking for their own, um, you know, kind of uh, backing in the in the international community. Um, and uh, and that then only perpetuates uh, the internal divisions. I think what has happened, and I, I actually think, Aiden, I would I would venture to say that the that the shift in uh, the Balkans and the kind of the moment of the missed opportunity came very early. Um, it was, you know, the the the, but whatever there, there were problems in interventions in Bosnia and in Kosovo, but they but they were done under the auspices of the Clinton administration in the 1990s. Um, and then with the arrival of the Bush administration already in 2000s and with 9-11, um, American attention shifted elsewhere, you know, and from being these places which were possibly gardens that they wished to cultivate or jungles that they wished to cultivate, um, American attention went and went elsewhere. And we became troubled spots, spaces of potential terrorism. You know, the security apparatus was reinforced. Um Stability became much more important than um, whatever democracy might mean, um, and so the the that 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 uh, so for, for already from the two thousands, I think we were set set up to fail, if you wish, in that in 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 a certain respect. Um, and yes, the, the the alternatives then in that world became ever more problematic. Um, and the Russian influence increased in that vacuum. Like while while America was fighting its wars on terror elsewhere, uh, the Russian influence in the region really became um, incredibly important. Um, and um, and its influence on, on on Serbia only grew. Uh, and uh, and so we are now this terrain of the of the fight of great powers. Um, you know uh, where where clients. Um, are paid off to be on one side or the other, then they shift sides. Uh, you know, you look at what's been happening in, in Macedonia or in Montenegro, and they're just kind of people, you pay one group, and then that group decides that they will go with someone else. Uh, and um, and so, um, you know, kind of the, 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 the good, ex the, the, the nice way of putting it would be that we are like Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s from the, from the perspective of the great powers. Yet, I, and I would like actually to uh, to talk about also um, to switch a bit maybe from, from our region because I do think it's important to to address. And you mentioned Aida earlier that you've been following. I mean, Ukraine since 2000 and 2014, and and I do think that it's important to also, as we're talking about the EU and the US and Western values and like whether we can still consider them as uh, what they once were. We're seeing a lot of criticism in the way, of course, that. Um, the discussion, the narratives are being shaped about what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in Palestine, and uh, and I, as I was thinking about this, um, when we when we started talking about your review to publish it at uh, uh, at, at Kosovo 2.0, I said to you that I I'm really curious if you had published it back in 2006, what kind of a reception it uh, it would have had, because I do think that there were even less voices as such that were public at that time in terms of putting their, their work publicly and criticizing the international community, at least in, within our countries. And you, you said that, um, that you fear that uh, even that you would have, would have been remained a marginal voice back then, that uh, it, it, maybe your text wouldn't have been, I mean, I do think it has resonated since we published it uh, a week ago. So it's really resonated with our readers. It's being shared a lot. Like it's getting a, a lot of traction at K2.0. So it made me think about voices in the margin of today. So the voices that are being critical today towards the Western narrative that, are, that we're seeing, whether in the media or from Western governments towards what's happening in, in Gaza, these critical voices 
are they in the margins or are they actually really are we seeing a moment that they're breaking out of the uh, of the of the margins because we're seeing there is more criticism i feel uh that that there's more criticism this time as compared to other cycles of violence that have happened in palestine between israel and uh, and palestine so is this concept of also the margins kind of being challenged and shaken and do you see it positive i mean kind of with an optimism or not it's very difficult to talk of optimism actually uh when we see what's happening uh, in gaza but just in terms of critic voices the critiques that are being uh, shaped today well the west has changed in the meantime i I, th i think that that's kind of the interesting thing again the jungle has come in okay whether whether borel likes it or not uh you know europe is much more diverse uh than it used to be some decades ago um united states has always been a diverse space but i think the voices have find are finding themselves that you know a, an easier time of our that, that to articulate themselves um and but therefore the backlash is also uh more intense so you have kind of a very explicit suppression um of voices and repression of voices on campuses in the united states uh you know the banning of protests the german banning of um even kind of jewish uh demonstrations in support of palestinians um so so they need more repression in a certain sense to tame these to tame these voices but i think uh yes there are more people speaking speaking up speaking up critically um and 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 what's important to say here this is not these critiques of the west are not necessarily the ones which are abolished the west they are they're really voices for trying to make that west uh more inclusive and more aligned with its own realities um you know this is this is and that that comes back to the question of alternatives i keep on thinking like you know do, do i uh would i rather side with russia and china in this world no i wouldn't um you know i don't i don't necessarily see them as alternatives i don't see them as providing uh a kind of a world without genocides and without without violence um but i do deeply regret uh that the western response to what's happening in the world is the one as i said of of trying to be smaller whiter um and and more christian and aiden i would like to connect uh, with you in this question uh, in this question as well about kind of equality in a way like of being uh, being an equal partner in in with with the west when we're talking about shaping the future of the eu and of also what democracy is going to be because it's it's very much obvious uh, for a few years now and especially today that that the eu needs to be discussing more about what its future is going to be and it has to potentially also rethink uh, how is what its role is going to be in the region because it's very much obvious that we're not going to be joining anytime soon but that doesn't mean that ties need to be cut completely either of course not so and i mean i'm a bit not hesitant but when i think of just kind of the eu's approach towards uh towards the course of our government when it was more assertive at the table it was immediately to kind of try to show its to show its place and say that well we are the ones that control what's talked about at the uh, at the table and so i feel like there's not an understanding with like within european circles or like centers or whatnot that th that table has to include more people in, in these discussions in terms of uh where we headed <laughs> like how we make sure that we protect human values such as human rights freedom of expression human dignity rule of law and that we can participate equally in those the conversations that we're not no longer in the state that we just need to be to be this is taught all the all the time so how do you how do you see this like how could we kind of just like envision something like that uh happening in this momentum where also the eu is being called i do feel like potentially maybe it is being called out more about that this approach is not is not working and it's not going to to work can we can we see things changing a bit or some shifts happening I don't think the current leadership in the in Brussels and <clears throat> um in some of the key capitals in the West are seem to be receptive to the idea that something quite fundamental needs to change but uh, um that isn't necessarily the end of the discussion. I think if you look at progressive change throughout history it, it it tends to come after some 
dark period. You know, something bad happens and people realize that the old way of doing things has to change and we have to move on. And this is one of the, the darkest periods, certainly, that I've, I've lived through. Um, and you look around the world and you can see only bad news. Um, you can see as well inside the European Union and, you know, with somebody like Erdogan in Hungary and people like that, you, you're not going to look at him and say he's more democratic and more progressive than Alban Kurti in Kosovo. I mean, that clearly isn't the case. You know, the, the Kosovo government has more obviously democratic values than, than the, the government of Hungary. So, like Aida said, the jungle is is now inside the garden. The garden is, is kind of um, not what it used to be. But I, I would also caution against this notion that there was some kind of golden age when, when the West was really operating according to a strict set of good values and stuff like that. I mean, at the time of the intervention in Kosovo, you know, um, the West was keen to stand up for the human rights of the Kosovo Albanians, but was quite happy for Turkey to um, oppress the Kurds and for, you know, the Palestinians to be oppressed by Israel and other places around the world. So it's always been inconsistent. It's always been the case that, you know, states, big states in particular, they're not charities, you know, they, 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 they're not moral actors. They tend to have key strategic interests. And at, at that particular juncture in 1999, there was a coincidence between the need to help the Kosovo Albanians and the need to project power into Eastern Europe. Now, that doesn't mean it was the wrong thing to do. I'm very happy that they did intervene. But I think that there is, uh, we can fall into a trap of thinking back to the 90s as this golden age, which certainly um, isn't the case. But in terms of the, the, the present, there was certainly a number of ideas that came out around that time and lots of um, ideals expressed regarding human rights and, and the rights of women, the rights of refugees and all these kinds of things that did have some impact and, and do have a legacy as well. You know, most of the students that I teach, the first year students in particular, they come in and they're, they're completely cynical about international politics. They think it's just about power and about money and about arms and, and, you know, military might and all that kind of stuff. And I try to say to them, well, there are some examples of things that have happened in the last 25 years that maybe aren't as effective now as we would like them to be, but that could become more effective as time goes on. And and if the present moment is one of these climaxes when the old society, you know, is is is, is starting to crumble, I would hope that the progressive forces throughout the world, whether that's in America, whether that's in the UK, whether that's in Kosovo, will increasingly come to the fore and replace the, the, the hollow men that now um, inhabit the, the, you know, the, the, the offices of power. People like Joseph Burrell, who is such a relic of that old age of, of, of um, European imperialism, essentially, you know. And, and I think that that's where we can see some hope. But it, it's, it's a hope that has to stem from that humility within the West itself to say, we just don't have all the answers. We went through a phase where we thought we were now the teacher in charge of a class and everyone has to listen to us. And actually now we have to take a seat and listen to what other people have to say, you know, and voices from the Balkans, but also dissident voices inside, you know, the, the West itself, whether that's Black Lives Matter movement or, or, or anything else, you know, because these people do exist. And um, one would hope, if there is any hope, that um, they will come to the fore as the old society and the old order starts to crumble. Well, we we're almost uh, coming uh, we're coming at the end, uh, at the end of the show, and I would just like to ask you both for the end, because you also both come from academia, both published not just in media but in in, in journals as well, and just. But besides that, I think um, we're seeing uh, again. I think as of recently with what's happening in, in Gaza, and uh, so with, with with Palestine, we're seeing that there's also a lot of more expectations coming from universities, also to see to to come out and see, have a stance on certain issues and whatnot. And there's been a lot of backlash in that regard uh, uh, as well with regard to certain statements. Um, but just, I'm using this kind of as to set up an answer from the both of you of how do you see the role of academia to get engaged in these discussions? So besides just the publishing and teaching, are there other spaces where where academia can be can be more can be more engaged and i do think that sometimes in crises like moments that we're living in you need those voices also uh, to you you need them to to be out there you need them to be present you need them to be to be heard so it does it happen enough or how do you how do you see the role of academia aida maybe i mean i i, I think uh, you know the the universities have become more, um, at least in the United States, I think it is, it, 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 as Aidan mentioned, I think it's the Black Lives Matter, which has actually kind of uh, mobilized and galvanized uh, a number of students. I think the Trump administration also has kind of 
uh, you know, was was a was a great foil for a lot of resistance on campuses, and so the students the students have been mobilized and the teachers have been standing up. Uh, but there is also a, a, a really very serious concerted effort um, to um, transform academic spaces into ones which uh, uh, align uh, with the right wing uh, vision of the of the world. Um, so it's a terrain of struggle, which I don't think that the universities have been in that, in that way since probably the nineteen the nineteen sixties, and we don't know what the outcome of these of these struggles uh, will be. Um, but we do. Uh, there is a tremendous. I mean, in the United States, at least the tenure is under threat, but it still exists, and people should be using their voices when they have these protections. Um, and. Uh, and then it's also it's a space for it's a space which still allows for some reflection. I've been thinking about, I mean, I'm 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 obsessing and crying over Gaza, and you know because you cannot but look at what's happening, but through the lens of kind of Srebrenica and genocide, um, if you come if you come from Bosnia, uh, but you know my all my colleagues, my best academic friends, my you know have actually worked for decades on on uncovering these. You know the, the the kind of the Jewish Muslim relations, the history of the Jewish Muslim relations, the 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 I don't even like to use the word coexistence, the kind of the interwoven fabric uh, of life um, in Israel Palestine, but also but also elsewhere, um, and it's difficult to do that in other spaces. Um, you know, so we have to use these. I think the academic spaces have to be used. Um, as 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 kind of um, you know the 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 last refuge of a of a different and alternative perspective on the world, um, you know, and particularly as we as we talked, the one in which these kind of divisions between the jungles and the gardens um, are completely abolished. Eden, um, I think if we're if we're reliant on academics to to make the world a better place, we're in a much worse position than than I feared. You know, um, <laughs> academics in in my experience um, are not all of them, obviously, but they are amongst the most conservative, um, self interested um, people I've I've ever come across. You know, and it's it's not necessarily that the university says to academics you can't say this and you can't say that. It's just that they calculate for my career, I probably shouldn't say this. Um, and there is a massive amount of self-censorship. Now, whether that's to do with Gaza or whether it's to do with anything else, you know, academics are, are inherently conservative people who tend to have come from a particular kind of a background, a quite a, a privileged background. And, and whether they realize it or not, they want to perpetuate that kind of privilege that they have and, and, and um, get the nice job and say the nice things to the nice professors and all these kinds of things. And, and, and that's how that, that world works. It's a really uh, um, insidious, um, it's full of nepotism, all that kind of stuff that goes on there. And, you know, I'm from Limerick. I, I don't give a damn what anybody thinks about what I say. And I've, that's what I've done in my career. And it's, it's would have been, I would be richer and I'd be working in a, you know, big, you know, high prestige university if I'd done studies on how has the UN helped women's rights in Kosovo? You know, and you get funding for that. But if you if you you know looking for funding, criticizing the West or criticizing international intervention, you just don't get it. And then nobody says we're not giving it to you because it's not what we want to hear. But you know, other academics that that I know, they they write academic books and journal articles, and they say things that just they know aren't true. You know, they know that these concepts and these ideas actually in practice don't work. But it's what keeps them in a job. You know, and they're not going to say the West's policy towards Gaza is a disgrace and what's happening is, is ethnic cleansing and, and genocide and God knows what. You know, not because they don't believe it, but because they just think my life will be easier if I don't say that. And, and it certainly happens with academics who come to the Balkans, but it also has to be said that there's an awful lot of academics from the Balkans who also engage in that kind of self-censorship. But, you know, there are a huge number of brilliant academics from Kosovo and from Bosnia and from, from elsewhere throughout the region who really say these critical things and have, have from the beginning advanced critical perspectives on the international engagement. And they have been largely pushed to the side. But there are spaces where those critiques exist, um, but they're not, you know, very fertile. And if you want a, a, a comfortable life and if you want to meet the ambassadors and, you know, academics of such a, 
you know, that they, they assume that if they meet a, a prime minister or a president or a foreign minister, that, you know, something, they've done something wonderful in their career, you know, and they, they're desperate to get that acclaim. So they say all the right things and they get to go to these wine receptions and whatever. And, and, and it's, that's the tragedy of academia. It's not a place like it may well have been in the 1960s where it was, it was radical and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it is very, very, very conservative. And, and, um, I don't go to large academic conferences anymore because it, they are amongst the most boring people I think I've ever met, you know, and um, I, I'm glad that I don't do that. You know, it's, it's, it's not an area for radical ideas and thinking, you know, certainly the mainstream academia. Well, at least there are people in academia, I would say, is the, the both of you that I really had, a, it was a huge privilege and uh, it was to have you on the show and to talk to you today. And I would just like to thank you, uh, to thank you for being on other talking points. And uh, I'm hoping that we will be hearing more of your views uh, at Kosovo 2.0 uh, as well. Aida, thank you so much. Thank you, Bessa. Thank you for, thank you for nurturing the space for these conversations. Thank you. And Aidan, it was great also having you uh, at our offices, finally. Thank you, Vesa. Yeah, it's great. And uh, keep up the good work. Yeah. Other Talking Points is a K2.0 podcast. You can listen to it regularly on our website, kosovo2.0.com, or by subscribing to K2.0 on Spotify, Apple Music, or YouTube.